If you're getting into turbocharged engines, you've probably heard people talk about blow-off valves and wastegates like they're the same part. They both deal with pressure, they both make a difference in how your turbo behaves, and they both show up in every boosted engine diagram out there. But here's the truth most beginners miss. These two parts live on opposite sides of the turbo. They control two completely different things, and they protect the engine in completely different ways. So today we're clearing that up. You'll understand what the wastegate actually does, why the blow-off valve exists, how each one controls pressure, and what happens when they fail or are set up wrong. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to look at any turbo setup, stock or aftermarket, and instantly know what keeps the boost under control and what keeps the turbo alive between shifts. Let's start with the wastegate, because this thing is the real boss of boost. Every turbocharger has a hot side and a cold side. Exhaust energy spins the turbine wheel, the turbine spins the compressor wheel, and the compressor forces air into the engine. More exhaust equals more turbine speed, which equals more boost. Sounds simple, right? The problem is that your engine doesn't always want max boost. At low RPM, you want quick spool. At cruising speed, you want mild boost. And at full throttle, you want high boost, but not too much, because uncontrolled boost pressure will absolutely destroy an engine. That's where the wastegate steps in. This valve sits on the exhaust side and decides how much exhaust gas actually reaches the turbine. When the engine reaches the boost level you've set, usually whatever the spring pressure is inside the wastegate, the valve begins to open. The moment it lifts, it diverts some exhaust around the turbine instead of into it. The less exhaust that reaches the turbine, the slower the turbo spins. And the slower it spins, the less boost you make. That's boost control in its purest form. Most wastegates are spring-loaded. Boost pressure from the compressor housing pushes against the spring. When boost reaches the spring's rating, like 7 PSI, 10 PSI, 14 PSI, whatever you installed, the spring can't hold the valve closed anymore and it starts to open. That pressure floor is what we call gate pressure. It's the minimum boost the turbo will make with no controller or special tuning. Internal wastegates are built right into the turbine housing. They use a little flapper door that opens to bypass exhaust. They work great on factory engines and mild builds because they're simple and compact. But they don't flow a ton of exhaust, so if you start pushing a turbo harder than it was designed for, the internal wastegate can't bypass enough exhaust to slow the turbine down. That's when you get boost creep. The engine revs higher, exhaust flow increases, and the turbo just keeps making more pressure even though the wastegate is fully open. Overboost, detonation, broken pistons, that's how engines die. External wastegates solve all of that. They sit off the manifold in their own little housing. They use bigger valves, better flow paths, and stronger materials so they can handle higher temperatures and way more exhaust volume. With an external gate, you get quicker response, more accurate boost control, and far less back pressure in the manifold. And the best part is that you can tune them. You can swap springs, change valve sizes, add coolant ports for heat management, and run multiple gates if the setup needs it. Performance builds almost always run external gates because boost control becomes tighter and smoother. Some manufacturers even machine the housings with CFD-tested flow paths so exhaust exits cleanly without turbulence. That's why high-end wastegates stay consistent even when the engine is making big power for long periods. The diaphragm materials are heat resistant, the valve coatings prevent sticking, and the seat is removable in case it wears out or gets damaged during welding. Something a lot of people don't realize is that your choice of spring matters just as much as the wastegate itself. A general rule is that your target boost should be no more than double your spring pressure. If you try to make, say, 20 PSI on a 5 PSI spring, the boost controller has almost zero authority. The reference signal becomes weak, the valve starts getting blown open too early, and boost becomes unstable. For the best spool and most consistent power, you want a spring that's roughly 10-20% below your target boost. That keeps response sharp and control predictable. Before we continue, please hit that like button and share this video if you're learning something new. And don't forget to subscribe. It really helps the channel grow so I can keep breaking down these systems in a simple, understandable way. Now let's switch to the other side of the turbo, the cold side. 
and talk about the blow-off valve. This one is all about protecting the turbo and keeping your drivability smooth when you lift off the throttle. When the throttle is open and you're building boost, compressed air is rushing from the turbo, through the intercooler, through the piping, and into the engine. The turbo is spinning fast, pushing a ton of air forward, but the instant you let off the gas, like during a gear change, the throttle plate snaps shut. You now have high pressure air slamming into a closed door. The turbo is still spinning fast, but there's nowhere for that air to go. If you don't give that trapped pressure an escape route, it forces itself backward into the compressor wheel. That can cause compressor surge magnetic, violent pulsing or fluttering that tries to stop the turbo from spinning. Over time, that can bend blades, stress the bearings, or even cause shaft failure. The blow-off valve solves that by giving the pressurized air somewhere to go. When you let off the throttle, the engine makes vacuum. That vacuum signal pulls the blow-off valve open, releasing the excess pressure either back into the intake, a recirculating BOV, or into the atmosphere, the classic psh sound. The compressor wheel keeps spinning freely, the turbo stays healthy, and throttle response stays sharp when you get back on the gas. This is why the BOV and the wastegate are not interchangeable. The wastegate controls boost before the turbo makes it. The blow-off valve releases pressure after the turbo has already made it. One protects the engine from too much boost. The other protects the turbo from pressure spikes during throttle changes. On modern engines, the engine management system controls the wastegate electronically. It uses sensors for boost, throttle position, load, and air temperature to decide how much wastegate lift is needed at any moment. If it wants more power, it keeps the wastegate closed longer. If it wants to protect the engine, it opens the wastegate early. The BOV, on the other hand, is usually not electronically commanded. It's mechanical. It listens only to vacuum, boost, and throttle behavior. When either part fails, you feel it immediately. A stuck open wastegate gives you low boost, sluggish acceleration, and no top end power. A stuck closed wastegate leads to dangerous overboost. A leaking blow off valve gives you a wandering idle slow spool and a soft, mushy throttle response. And a BOV that can't open quickly enough causes compressor surge. That fluttering sound some people think is cool, but is actually the compressor wheel slamming air backward. So here's the simplest way to remember it. The wastegate controls how much boost you make. The blow-off valve controls what happens to that boost when you suddenly don't need it. One manages power, the other manages safety for the turbo between shifts. And that's the full picture. When you understand the roles of both parts, tuning becomes easier, diagnosing becomes faster, and you avoid costly mistakes that can ruin a turbo, an engine, or both. If this helped you understand the difference between a wastegate and a blow-off valve, drop a comment and let me know what kind of turbo setup you're running. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that button. We've got more real-world turbo tuning, DIY repairs, and performance breakdowns on the way. Thanks for watching Auto V Fix, and I'll see you in the next one.